Good morning, church, and welcome to all those who are joining us live on Zoom and to those who are watching later on YouTube. Let me just start with reading from Psalm 18. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my salvation. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saved me from my enemies. Let us pray. Loving God, I just thank you that you've gathered us here this morning to worship and praise you. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit would guide us as we join in unity in singing your praises. In Jesus' name, amen. And I just encourage those who are watching on YouTube to turn to a video. Uh, if you search for Step by Step, Rich Mullins, uh, you'll find the worship song that we're singing together today. My God, I will follow you all the days of my life, step by step. Well, I've got a couple of announcements today. The first one being uh, that most of you, hopefully all of you have received an email from me just yesterday or on Friday, just outlining the decision that uh, the Board of Elders are currently making about reopening the church. Obviously, we're all very keen to be back in the building together. Uh, however, the, the earliest we can do that, according to the Victorian government and the roadmap that they've laid out for us, is the 7th of November. However, we're thinking of putting off that date a little bit further, uh, possibly one more week delay, because there are a number of factors to consider. Uh, one of them being that there's more rigorous cleaning and more rigorous administration required, uh, as you would appreciate. The government have requested or have um, ordered uh, everyone who gathers to be vaccinated. And if they're not vaccinated, then uh, we need to run a separate service. Uh, so that is a bit complicated. We don't like to discriminate. Obviously, we don't want to have to turn people away at our door. Uh, but unfortunately, we do have to um, abide by these uh, restrictions because of the, the health concerns. And so what that means is the elders will just need to uh, think about logistically how, how and when we open up and so that everyone can uh, remain safe. My second announcement is just in regards to the trees at the front of our church property. Uh, sadly, they uh, do have to go as I said uh, a couple of weeks ago, they've been shedding branches uh, every storm, that violent storm that we have. And so it's a, it's a safety issue. Um, they're actually being removed as I speak. And so it's, it's actually good timing that uh, no one else is around on the property. And so the tree removers can do their job uh, without um, anyone around. So, uh, it will be a bit of a shock when you when you return to the building, uh, you'll see uh, that it'll be quite bare for a while until we replant and put a, a native garden and, and other things in there. OK, now I'm going to uh, take, take it over to Les now, who's going to lead us in communion. And if you haven't already done so, I uh, encourage you just to uh, get some bread and, and juice and uh, join us for the Lord's Supper together. Thank you. Thanks, Gabriel. Morning, everybody. Uh, Gabriel, thank you for the choice of your worship song this morning. That's actually one of the two songs I chose at my baptism, so it's very meaningful for me, so thank you. As I've been watching the evening news each night this week, there's been a recurring um, phrase mentioned on the news, and that is, Freedom Friday, and which related to Victoria reaching 70% double-dosed vaccination. And so the promise was that when we got to that stage, there, we would be, we would get some degree of freedom, we would, that the lockdown wouldn't be as severe. And then probably in the next 
week or so when we hit 80%, we get even more freedom. And as I, as I was re reflecting on the, on the phrase Freedom Friday, I was thinking, as Christians, followers of Jesus, I think we have a different Freedom Friday in mind because that was the day that an innocent man was put to death for, for us. And we know that man as, as Jesus. We know him as our Lord and our Saviour. And as I was reflecting on what freedom is, often we consider freedom to be a very personal or individual thing. And we see freedom as being able to do what we want, when we want, where we want, and with who we want. But freedom has a more um, corporate idea. It, it, it relates to society because often we have to put our individual freedoms to one side for the good of society. And I think that's what the government has been talking about recently with COVID, that we, we need to do certain things for the, for the good of the state so that if we self-isolate, if we get vaccinated, if we wear a mask, that's all helping Victoria. And every so often you hear that you hear the phrase that we have to make sacrifices. As a Christian, I know that making sacrifices isn't a very good idea because it has it's a continual thing. We need to keep making sacrifices because we're not perfect. And if, as we go through the Old Testament, we see how the the, the nation of Israel would sacrifice regularly for the sins of the individual and the sins of the nation. But being followers of Jesus on this side of the cross, we know that we don't need to make any sacrifices for our spiritual well-being because that's already been done. It was done by Jesus. Even so, but even though Jesus did it, that doesn't mean we're off the hook because we have to actually accept personally what he did for us. It's all, it's all very well to, to see the death and resurrection of Jesus as a historical fact. But if we recognise that he did that for us and we recognise our need for that to happen, our need for forgiveness, our need of that ultimate sacrifice, then we're set free. We're set free from the power of sin. We're set free from the penalty of sin because Jesus has paid that price. Because we all know that we live with the presence of sin still impacts our lives, but it has no power and it has no penalty over us. So I invite you as we share our cracker and some juice to just reflect on what Jesus did for each of us on the cross. Because Jesus took a bit of bread and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I invite us to eat together and remember the, the body of Jesus which is given for us. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's drink together.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are prepared to send your son, your only son, into the world to reveal more of yourself and to ultimately die for us, to die for the sin of the world. And Father, we thank you that we recognise who Jesus is. He's your son. He's our saviour. He's our Lord. We thank you that we have been set free. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to live in the freedom that you have given us. Father, help us to live in obedience. Help us to glorify you in whatever way we can. So, Father, we praise you and we thank you for what you've done for us through Jesus. Father, we thank you also for our church. We thank you for the tremendous opportunity we have to meet each week. And, Father, even though we're meeting online this week, we thank you that you are with us. We can sense your presence. We, we know that you are the focus of our gathering this morning. And, Father, as we approach the time when we're able to meet again in person, we just pray for, for wisdom for, for Gabriel and Catherine and for, and for the elders as they continue to work through how best to commence our services in a safe way. So, Father, we just pray that you give us patience, that the day will come when we're able to meet in person again, we're able to, to worship together. We're able to fellowship together in person. Father, we thank you that we also have the opportunity to, to give to the, to the financial um, needs of our church. And Father, we thank you that the technology exists for us to do that online. And Father, we pray that you'd help those responsible to use these, do this money wisely. Father, not only for the maintenance of our church, but, Father, for the advancement of your kingdom in our community. So, Father, we pray for your wisdom in that. Father, we pray for those in our, in our family who are not well. Father, we thank you that Paul is able to join us this morning. We thank you that his surgery went well and that he's well on the way to recovery. Father, we pray for those within our midst who are still waiting on um, COVID vaccinations. Father, we just pray that um, as they receive those vaccinations, there would be no adverse effects and that um, as that number of vaccinations goes up, it makes closer the date to when we're able to meet together. Father, we pray for Catherine as she brings your word soon. Father, we just Thank you for the truth of your word, for its power. And we, Father, we pray that as we listen to Catherine, that we would just be able to apply what we hear into our lives, that um, we would just be able to, to live for you in a very fruitful, in a very real way. So, Father, we commit the rest of our service to you and just pray that you continue to be with us. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. It's it's such a such a lovely thing to be able to um yeah just see you here and together with you today. And I hope um that you have had a lovely weekend. Um, perhaps you've enjoyed a little bit more freedom. We are having a bit of a laugh in our family about the first things you do when you've got a bit of a freedom. So, for me, I was uh, blessed. Gabriel uh, released me for the day and I got to um, go up into the Dandenong Ranges and I wandered in the Arboretum to my heart's desire um, and just had a lovely day with the trees and the sunshine and with God and, and meditating on this scripture. So, um, yeah, just really grateful to that, to, um, for having that space and for the beautiful weather that we had on Friday. Um, Gabriel's uh, first thing that he was chomping at the bit to do on um, first thing on Saturday morning was to empty the trailer finally and take it to the tip <laughs> because tips were open. So, um, and just as he was returning from the tip, it turned out that our neighbour was doing exactly the same thing. So, um, 
it seems that, uh, you know, hairdressers, cafes, and for me, going for walks and visiting uh, a rose nursery uh, are top on the agenda. But um, yeah, God bless our blokes who, who want to get rid of the rubbish as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been, um, it's been interesting times, hasn't it? And um, as uh, we are going to um, continue to explore um, the book of James, I think um, the passage that um, we're going to look at today is really topical, I think, um, for us as we consider sort of re-engaging um, socially again. It's, um, it's really about what kind of relationships do we want to cultivate in our lives. Um, a lot of the book of James has been uh, full of teachings about, well, if we have faith, what is the fruit of that? What does it look like um, to actually produce fruit in our lives? And so, and so we're going to read this passage now, but just yeah, keep that lens on of what does this say to us as we, um, as we re-engage socially with people, perhaps people that we haven't seen very more. So Gabriel's going to share um, the, the text um, and I'd love it. Uh, I don't know, um, Rose Bradley, are you happy to read for us? It would be lovely if you could. It's from James Here. 3. Here we go. Okay. James 3, 13 to 18. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honourable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's, God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Oh, thank you, Rose. Yeah, well, as I begin, uh, let me just pray the words of Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Just going to uh, share the screen now and um, you might want to just adjust, adjust your pictures so that um, you can just see, see people on the side um, or just see, see me only on the, on the side and then you can see the whole screen. Yeah, so as I was, as I was saying, the, the book of James is um, just an incredibly refreshing book. Um, I think partly because it, it just sticks so closely to the teachings of Jesus. Uh, it's, it's very, you can almost hear word for word some of Jesus's teachings and they're, they're so strongly kind of reflected um, all through the book of James. And particularly is this um, theme in his book of having congruence or having alignment with our faith, with our heart and with our actions, what we do. And particularly in chapter three is looking at what we say. Um, so looking at our words as the fruit of our lives. And I think as I've read this passage, what has emerged to me through, um, through James is this image of actually our relationships being like a garden. Um, and this, is, this really comes out in our vision as a church as well, that um, we want to live fruitful lives in the garden. So what do we, um, what kind of fruit do we want to be producing? And what are we cultivating um, in the relationships of our lives? Because really, when we look at it, we're not um, 
We're not people who are going to run a garden. We can't control a garden. But what we can do is we can cultivate it. And a big aspect of doing this is firstly um, managing this a very problematic aspect of all of our lives. And, and that is our speech, our words and our speech. Um, and so James points to our tongue and he gives quite a strong message on the tongue. Firstly, he says um, that teachers need to be especially careful. And I was really mindful of that, um, that warning at the beginning because we all stumble. Um, we all know uh, good people in our lives, good teachers in our lives especially, um, who have stumbled um, and, you know, can actually um, have hypocrisy in their lives and can say things um, but not do them. And or they can actually teach wrong things as well. And doing so um, brings a lot of damage to communities. And so, so those that are in authority or in a position of, of teaching need to be particularly careful. But uh, we all have experienced times in our lives, haven't we, where we have either said the wrong thing. We've all done that. We've also had times in our lives where we have heard people say hurtful things to us as well. And in this, um, in this context, James is actually speaking to a group of people um, who are quite volatile. Actually, they're, they're the scattered people of um, the Jerusalem church and they're living in very oppressive circumstances under a very oppressive political system. And they are oppressed. Some of them are facing um, really um, uh, abject poverty in their lives. And there is a lot of temptation um, for being jealous, um, for coveting what others have. Um, there is temptation to be envious and to harbour bitterness. And there is also the temptation actually to even um, to incite violence, um, to to actually get um, more rights and more privileges in their lives. So these are the kinds of temptations that are before the people. And there was a, a movement even among the Christians at that time called the Zealot Movement, which was a violent and rebellious movement. And so James is actually speaking directly into these temptations and into these anxieties and pressures that the people are experiencing. And he is pointing them back to Jesus. He's pointing them back to the kingdom. And he's pointing them back to the ways of the kingdom. And so we hear right through um, this teaching, we hear Jesus' Sermon on the Mountain about loving enemies, about being peacemakers, who are also the children of God. And so firstly, he points to the tongue. <laughs> what an uncontrollable thing the tongue is. It says people can tame all sorts of animals. They can tame birds and reptiles and fish. But no one, not one person, has managed to tame their tongue. Now, I have heard recently that there is actually this amazing community in Papua New Guinea that have this special um, kind of uh, way of catching sharks. And this is a tradition that's been passed on to them um, from their ancestors. And, uh, and there are still a few people that practice this tradition. And basically they go to the edges of the water um, or they go out in their fishing boats and they sing. And they actually sing a kind of gentle lullaby to the sharks. And the sharks come and they're lulled and believe it or not, they actually, um, after giving a respect and honour to, to the sharks in their songs, they, they gratefully catch the sharks and um, that becomes part of their, their harvest of the sea, which sustains their life. So believe it or not, even a shark can be tamed. And, but, and, and James also talks about um, large beasts or large animals like horses or oxes and these can actually be controlled by just a little bit in the mouth and they, they steer the direction of the animal. So the animal could uh, 
be led into a war or it could be led to plough a field. It could be led to trample something or it could be led um, to transport something. Um, these are the things that can be done um, through this bit in the mouth that, um, where a master can control its horse. And so it is with the tongue. The tongue is like a little bit in our mouth that control our whole life. And unless we get some kind of charge of this tongue of ours, um, it could wreak havoc and destruction. And alternatively, it could wreak beautiful productivity, blessing and life. So throughout all these images that um, Jade brings to us, there are always those choices before us. The other one is, is also, um, the other image is of a small rudder. A small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. So we can see that a rudder is essential in the storms, isn't it? It's essential in the storms of life to steer our way through difficult times. If we had no rudder, we'd be lost. And I think this image actually speaks to um, the need to use our tongue. How often could we be in a situation where we, we see um, something wrong emerging before us, where we hear, perhaps we hear um, someone in distress, we hear someone being belittled, we hear someone being oppressed, and we don't speak up. So the tongue is also a... a, a it's a, it's a wonderful instrument in our mouths to steer through a storm. But it could also lead us straight into the waves. It could also crash us against the rocks if we're not careful. And so <laughs> I wonder if you can guess who these, these people are. So I have a little story to tell leading up to James's third image of what the tongue could be like. And this was uh, back in our youth. Um, we were uh, young, I guess, uh, hippies, you could probably call us. Um, in our student days, we'd heard of, um, yeah, the, the, uh, the plans that were going ahead, um, what, we've, what we sort of understood were really destructive plans um, to open a second uranium mine. Um, up in Kakadu National Park. And this was uh, against the express wishes of the traditional owners. Um, there was a lot of uh, concern about the destruction of the environment, the release of radiation into the environment. And also there were um, plans for that uranium to be sold um, for the making of nuclear weapons, um, which is also a tool of destruction. So uh, we were, we were part of a movement where we uh, hopped on a bus and after three and a half days, we arrived at Kakadu National Park. It was the middle of the dry season. It was hot, dry and dusty. And we stayed in a campground there. And we prepared some, uh, with, with the other people, we prepared some silent, uh, some, not silent, some, some peaceful ways of uh, giving our presence and our witness to what we felt were, were things that weren't uh, weren't right, and uh, what? So one of the planned events was that we uh, made ourselves uh, these lanterns, and on it we put the symbol that you can see on Gabriel's T-shirt there of um, the stopping the mine, a uh, symbol of the handprint, and and we um, the idea was that we would join a parade of people, um, we would uh, just quietly and peacefully walk up to the the entrance of the gate um, to the road that led to where the mine was. Um, we weren't trespassing, we were just on public land. And we were bearing these lanterns. Um, we would just um, be there like a vigil. And so we spent all day making these mountains, uh, these lanterns. And just before it got dark, we began, uh, what we didn't realize was a very long walk um, to where we were going. And we we're perhaps a bit underprepared. We only had a little bit of water and a little bit of food with us. And um, and we we began, we realised we were a bit slower than the rest and we began to lag behind the crowd. And finally, we were kind of on our own and getting quite tired holding these lanterns. 
And so we hung them um, by the side of the road and sat down to rest for a little while. And uh, we just hung them. I don't know if you've seen those boundary markers on the sides of roads. They're just these white stakes with a red reflector so that people know on a, on a remote country road where the edges are. And that's where we hung our lantern while we sat a little way off to rest. And then to our horror, only a, a, a couple of minutes later, when we turned to look at our lanterns, we realised that there was this, an, this large grass fire had just started out of nowhere. It seemed that and our, and our lanterns were burning in the very middle of it. And um, we ran up to it, we poured all the water we had on it, we tried stamping it out, but we could not extinguish this fire. It was, it was starting to spread. I don't know if you've seen a grass fire spread. And so unwittingly, we had started a bushfire. Well, it felt like we were about to start a bushfire. By the grace of God, and I really think this was miraculous for us, um, someone else from the camp drove past at just that moment, stopped, had a fire extinguisher in their car and came out and put, put the whole thing out. Um, we were so relieved. And soon afterwards, the police came as well. <laughs> and um, when they saw our distress, uh, they realised that we, it was not an intentional thing to do. So we were just imagining the headlines, you know, people trying to save the national park, burn it right down. <laughs> this was this was the, the horror of what we'd done. So with our sort of tail between our legs, we um, gave up on the rest of the, the lantern march and, and walked back to the camp. But I think this uh, kind of shows you how both intentionally and unintentionally we can start fires. And the thing is, what do we want, what kind of people do we want to be? James says, James says that a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And that, that was what we were really confronted with. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. So these are, again, really, really strong words about the tongue. So basically, what James is really pointing to through these images of wild beasts, of a rudder, and of a, of a fire, is that the tongue and words are very powerful. Our words are extremely powerful. And our words are probably one of the most distinctive things in our lives that shows us who we are and who we are right in our innermost heart, in our innermost thoughts. And considering this, what kind of people do we want to be? How do we want to use our words? Do we want to use our words to start? Or like those wonderful people that came with the fire extinguisher at just the right time, do we want to be people that can put out fires, that can extinguish fires that, that can actually be peacemakers. And so we all know the words can break relationships, they can break whole families, they can tear apart a church, they can tear apart a nation, they can incite violence and racism, they can belittle and undermine. They can start enmity and they can even cause war. Words can burn and they can harm. But on the other hand, words can be wonderful. They can restore and they can repair. They can offer comfort and forgiveness. They can extend peace and they can extend grace. We can speak words of love into people's lives. We can speak words of encouragement into people's lives. We can use our words to pray and to intercede for our world. And we can use our words to bless. So what James really places before us is actually the choices that we have in our life. 
and he's quite um, dualistic about it. He actually begins, he actually starts to talk about the words that come from our lives and says, how can we at one breath worship God, but then use our same mouths to curse other people, people who are made in the image of God? This shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that we have both uh, blessing and cursing coming from the same mouth. We actually really need to look at our hearts. We actually need to see what we're cultivating in our hearts because this is where the overflow comes. This is where what leads to the fruit of our lives and to particularly to how we use our speech. And so James uh, really draw, starts to draw on this image of cultivating and of tending the garden of relationships in our lives. And firstly, and so one of the things he asks us is, what kind of seeds are we sowing? See, he says, that those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Let's think about what we sow in our relationships. I like to think of um, the words that come in Paul's epistle too when he speaks of love. And again, Paul is talking about the alignment of the heart with our actions. But as we were, as we were talking about last week, Paul comes at it from, from the other way. He says, if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. So what James is talking about uh, showing our faith through our actions, Paul is also pointing to what are our motivations behind our actions, remembering that God sees our heart. And so if we want to be people who sow seeds of peace, we need to cultivate hearts of love. And Paul reminds us that love is patient and kind. It's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. See, time and time again, the Gospels and the Epistles, and in particular James, points to humility as being the key to wisdom and the key to right relationships. Where we don't need to boast, where we don't need to have our own way, because we seek the good of others first. And James also asks us, what kind of, what are we watering with? What kind of water do we use on this garden of ours? He asked, does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? What are we bringing to our relationships? Again, he's saying we, can, we just can't be divided. It's impossible for a spring to produce both healthy, fresh and life-giving water and at the same time produce bitter water, which is almost like a poison. We don't want to poison the relationships in our lives. We want to water, we want to water encouragement. We want to water blessing. We want to water love into our relationships. And again, this lines up with what exactly what Jesus says when he says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person brings good th things out of a good treasure and the evil person brings evil things out of an evil treasure. So our hearts are like these treasuries and what we store in our hearts is what will ultimately come out in our words. But the good news is that 
all we need to do is come to Jesus. If our hearts are feeling uh, parched, if our hearts are feeling bitter, if they're full of bitter water instead of life-giving water, Jesus just encourages us to come to him. And in John 7, we have this image of him standing up and calling out to the crowds, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. And James emphasises this too when he says, if any of you need wisdom, just ask the Lord. Ask the Lord and it will be given to you. But do so having faith in God and not in the things of this world. Don't be double-minded. Don't, don't try and have a heart that springs both fresh and bitter water. Just come to Jesus. Come to the river of life and be filled with his living water, which is, of course, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, which which cleanses, which edifies, which which purifies us, which purifies our lives, so that we have within us this overflow of love for others. And so, ultimately, James asks also, what kind of fruit are we producing? Does a fig tree produce olives? or a grapevine produce figs? This is the question. What kind of fruit are we producing? What is the evidence of the faith in our lives? It's impossible for a bad tree to produce good fruit, and it's impossible for a good tree to produce bad fruit, or for one kind of fruit tree to produce another kind of fruit as James puts it. The words of our mouth and the actions that come in a life lived in faith are evidence of the state of our hearts. And so we come back to that question of how shall we live? And particularly now as we re-engage with relationships, um, yeah, as we want to, in, in ways that are face-to-face, -face, in ways that are, are more natural for us. We want our relationships to be filled with the wisdom that James is speaking about. The wisdom from above that is first of all pure, it's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. And so this, I've, I really believe this passage is of incredible encouragement to us. Um, it, it, it reminds us of the responsibility that we have with every word that we speak. But it also reminds us of that incredible, incredible capacity that we have to be planting seeds of peace and reaping a harvest of righteousness in this world, in, in this time, in this day, in the relationships that we have, the relationships that we're blessed with every day. And so thinking about this, I was wondering what are the attitudes um, that we need? What are the attitudes that we can take from this that will help us to, to actually um, live with the fruit of good deeds in our lives, to speak words that are of mercy and, and peace? And when I think about it, it's talking about humility, humility that seeks to listen, to understand, Humility that checks its assumptions. Humility that really values the needs and rights of others. Humility that speaks of the humility of Christ, who did not take his position for granted. 
he actually gave himself up and took on the role of a slave, even unto death for us. Humility doesn't come naturally. Humility is hard because it involves putting our selfish ambitions, our needs, even our rights um, below others. But humility is the way of the kingdom and it's the way of wisdom. And I think it's easier to be humble when we're also grateful. When we actually just remember what Jesus has done for us. When we remember that our God is an abundant God, that he cares for us, that he sees us, that he knows us, that he listens to us. Then we remember that we are actually complete in him. This puts a peace in our hearts through gratitude and through love of our Lord. It puts a peace and a completeness in our hearts that helps us to sow seeds of peace in the world. And so when our full identity is complete in God, when we are grateful for the things he has done and when we cherish the relationships in our lives, when we are grateful to them and, and we belong to them in community as well, we'll find that this uh, overflow of good deeds, this overflow of encouraging words will become more and more natural in our lives. And this is not something that we uh, should even struggle for. It's really just something that we need to be open to. We need to continually ask God to give us hearts that are wise, hearts that are peaceful, hearts that are humble, and hearts of love. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Let's pray. Loving God, I thank you that you say we can come to you, all who are thirsty, and Lord, that you will give us your living water. And so Jesus, yeah, we just request on this day that you fill us with your living water, that you fill us to overflowing and remove any bitter or harmful thoughts from our from our hearts. Lord, that you teach us your ways of humility and that you show us your paths of love. And Lord, may our, our lives and the relationships in our lives be like a fruitful garden, full of blessing, of peace and righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.